pray with you before we begin let's bow together oh God that just stirs our souls up marching in the light of God what a summons a summons and a call to the Titanic generation this generation living in this end time moment of human history a moment that some would say is cloaked in darkness and yet as our hearts have, and minds have returned to this book for the last few evenings together, we have sensed that there is a very bright light that is shining on the pathway of the human race. We thank you for that light. We thank you for the realization that it comes from the heart of our forever father and our forever friend. Tonight, linked and bound together by the miracle of satellite technology, reunited as it were, we come once again to this moment where we seek truth May what you have to share for us through the Holy Scriptures, may this story that we must tell and share, may it be clear. And may we hear the voice of Christ, our forever friend, bidding us come and follow him. In his name we pray. Amen. I want to warn you tonight that the story you are about to hear is not in the Bible, which is precisely the point that I earnestly hope you will take home with you this evening, that you will ponder. I want to begin by sharing a poem. Some of you are connoisseurs of great poetry. This probably will not be ranked among the classics, although it makes a most classic and concise point. In fact, I want to invite you, as I read this poem, to see how quickly you can arrive at that point. Now, the title of the poem, The Calf Path. It's a little cow, calf, C-A-L-F, The Calf Path, and it's composed by Sam Walter Foss, a very un-Shakespearean name, as you can tell. But I want you to listen to this poem, because I believe it makes the point. One day, through the primeval wood, a calf walked home as good calves should, but made a trail all beat askew, a crooked trail as all calves do. 
Since then, 200 years have fled, and I infer the calf is dead. But still he left behind his trail, and thereby hangs my moral tale. The trail was taken up next day by a lone dog that passed that way. And then a wise bellwether sheep pursued the trail o'er vale and steep and drew the flock behind him too, as good bellwethers always do. And from that day o'er hill and glade, through those old woods a path was made, and many men wound in and out and dodged and turned and beat about and uttered words of righteous wrath, because t'was such a crooked path. But still they followed, do not laugh, the first migrations of that calf. And through this winding woodway stalked, because he wobbled when he walked. This forest path became a lane that bent and turned and turned again. This crooked lane became a road where many a poor horse with his load toiled beneath the burning sun and traveled some three miles in one. And thus a century and a half they trod the footsteps of that calf. Each day a hundred thousand rout followed a zigzag calf about, and o'er his crooked journey went the traffic of a continent. A hundred thousand men were led by one calf near three centuries dead. They followed still his crooked way and lost one hundred years a day. For thus such reverence is lent to well-established precedent. A moral lesson this might teach were I ordained and called to preach. For men are prone to go it blind along the calf paths of the mind and work away from sun to sun to do what other men have done. They follow in the beaten track and out and in and forth and back until their devious course pursue to keep a path that others do. But how the wise old wood gods laugh who saw the first primeval calf Ah, many things this tale might teach, but I am not ordained to preach. Wise old poet, isn't he? Because that is precisely what has happened in the tale that you and I are going to share tonight. When history played a trick on us, one little meandering away from the divine pathway of truth, just a stumbling little calf-like mistake, and centuries later, get this, nearly the whole world follows that wandering. A path, by the way, strangely, mysteriously contrary to the bright and shining light of this book. A crooked little path that crept into the church that Jesus built, the church Jesus left behind. What are we talking about? What in the world is this allegory possibly hinting at? And did it, in fact, happen tonight, the story? You can't read it in this book. In fact, tonight's story is when history wasn't his story. You know, in English, the two words, his story, make up the word history. But tonight, when history wasn't his story, a story that proves Jesus was right when he spoke these words. And I want you to open your Bible, please, to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 7. We need to get into this. Now, the story's not in this book. But we're going to take a look at a word or two from the Scripture to, to prepare us for the story we're about to share. This is page 975 in our Next Millennium Seminar Bibles here in our university host site. The rest of you around the world, you put that, as you're used to now, we'll put the verse up on the screen for you. This is Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, speaking of Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he, Jesus, answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, hold it right there, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is issuing a very grave warning. Are you catching it? When it comes to worship and worshiping. Be on your guard because how easily and how deceptively the traditions and commandments of man can infiltrate even the commandments of the eternal God. If you're not careful, here's Jesus' point. If you're not careful, verse 8 can happen. Look at verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition 
of men. All it takes is one little wandering calf off the pathway of truth, and pretty soon, one after another after another follow, until finally a broad highway of error has replaced the sure commandment of truth. Was Jesus right? Was he? When history played a trick on us. Before I take you to that tale, I, I need to share with you briefly how the tale was discovered. The outline, of course, of history has always been available. But back in 1975, a young Protestant enrolled in the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome and made history because he became the first Protestant in its four centuries of history as an institution. He was doing doctoral research, and that research was focusing on details that have been unearthed to make tonight's tale possible. When his research, get this, when it was all done, and he was awarded his degree, by the way, summa cum laude, which in Latin means the highest of honors, his research received the imprimatur of the church in Rome that granted his de a degree, which means they said, good housekeeping seal of approval, this is right. Now, in fact, when he was through and he had that imprimatur, the late Pope Paul VI awarded him a gold medallion. His name, Dr. Samuel Bacchiocchi. He happens to teach right here at Andrews University. He is, well, come on, where is he? Is he here? Where are you, Sam? Oh, there you are, Sam, bless your heart. My friend, my Italian friend, Sam Bacchiocchi. That was an incredible moment when you received that uh, dissertation with the imprimatur on it. Now, Dr. Bacchiocchi teaches uh, history and theology here at Andrews University. I have read in, uh, not, did you write it in Italian or Latin or a little bit of both? Yeah, well, I read it in English, actually, that <laughs> dissertation. I'm sure glad you translated it. I read it over 300 pages in that dissertation. I'm so honored to have him on the front row tonight. And, uh, you know, I'd have him come up here and share it, share the story with you. But he would just keep saying, Mamma mia, Mamma mia, over and over again. <laughs> and I wasn't sure the whole world would understand that. So. <laughs> anyway, he's here checking to make sure the facts are straight. Thank you very much, Sam, for uh, being here tonight. Any study of history, and here's what I've learned from uh, Dr. Bakayoki's research, any study of history of, of the early Christian church soon ends up in the boiling cauldron of three explosive ingredients, three volatile constituencies that have all been thrown together, and as a consequence, it takes all three of them to write this tale. What are the three? I'll give them to you. The Jewish nation, the Roman Empire, and the newly formed Christian church. Tonight, let's begin with the Jewish nation, the history of this great Spiritual people, come on, the whole world knows this history, mingled with ecstasy and heartache. You know how God raised them up on this fertile strip of land beside the Mediterranean. Kingdom of Israel, their sole mission was to tell a darkened world the truth. Talking about the song they just sang a moment ago, to shed the light of God on the pathway of darkness in this planet, to let the word get out that God is not somebody to be afraid of. He is someone to be a friend of. That was their mission. They were to take that story. But by and large, the tragic story is that over the centuries, Israel failed. They failed to fulfill this high calling. Now, it's true it was like a pendulum. They'd swing back and forth. When the pendulum was up on this side, they had this, this hankering for the gods of the nations around them. And when the pendulum would swing back to this side, then it was a very literalistic form of religion that didn't have the warmth and the passion of God in it. And once in a while, you bet, God would send prophet. He would send a prophet and another passionately always calling this nation back to the heart of this loving God that we've been encountering here. But by and large, they rejected those appeals. Finally, you know the story. God sends to them his own son. The Messiah himself comes. And they reject him as they had done the prophets. And God, remember, love not only grants you the right to say yes, it gives you the right to say no. And in faithfulness with his own love, he finally, I'm sure, in crushing pain and sorrow, grants their wish to be free of his leadership and guidance. And then we have the tragedies of national collapse that eventually become history. 
And that fertile land becomes the crossroads, the stomping grounds for the armies of the world's empires. All right. So by the time we come to the first century A.D., time of Christ, time of the New Testament here, the Jews are under the iron thumb of Rome. Now I need to tell you, Rome displayed a high regard and respect generally for Judaism and for their unique system of national, na national worship. Rome honored that. In fact, do you know that the Jews received the high status in the Roman Empire of being called a religio licita, a legal religion. They were allowed to flourish in the empire, but there was a small fly in the ointment, and that fly was the intense nationalistic patriotism of the Jews. They simply could not stomach the occupying Roman armies and administration. And you know what? I, I don't think any of us tonight could blame them. I mean, how would you and I feel? if on every corner here in Berrien Springs and occupying a foreign army stationed soldiers, we'd be absolutely incensed. And so let's not be too hard on the Jews. And in fact, it occurs to me, some of you watching tonight in the world right now know the very meaning of what we're describing. And so the Jews are furious. They are afraid. They feel violated. They feel betrayed. And so you can understand. That is simply being set up for a most explosive kind of an interrelationship between the Jews and the occupying Roman Empire. Now, in fact, it was this nationalistic hatred that precipitated and fanned the fires of continuing rebellion and revolt. During the time of Jesus, right here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the milieu is, is fairly quiet, politically speaking. But in the late 60s, oh my, violent uprising after uprising breaks out against Rome, and with its ironclad fist, Rome comes crashing in through the armies of Titus, thundering against the holy city of Jerusalem. Now, you probably know the story of history, how the citizens in that great city held out barbaric atrocities, Josephus tells us, taking place inside the city. But in AD 70, Titus breaks the resistance and sacks the city, the golden marble, one of the seven wonders of the world, is raised to the ground. The whole city is leveled. In fact, this summer, I had one glorious week to spend in the city of Jerusalem. I'll never, it, it, just, just a highlight of my life. And as we were taking on one of the tours, the archaeologists took us to a site down deep where they have actually found burned timber from Titus torching the city, along with the burned timber, the severed arm, skeletal arm of a woman. It was a, it was a gruesome moment when Rome steps in to crush. And by the way, this is only the beginning of a cycle of armed Jewish revolts, armed crushing Roman responses. It spans a period of 70 years. In fact, I want to give, I want to give a statistic to you. Historians have, have have concluded over the 70 year period from 65 AD to 135 AD, historians have estimated that during this period, more Jews died violently in Palestine, get this, than all the Americans, and I have to take my own country, all the Americans who died in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined. Over two million Jews were slaughtered from 65 A.D. to 135 A.D. And now moving down here, then comes a young Jewish guerrilla fighter named Bar Kokhba, a militant, messianic figure, and he rallies the masses behind him. All right, it's our turn to throw off the hated yoke of the Romans. And this time, oh boy, when Rome comes thundering back this time, it is with a furious take no prisoners kind of vengeance. The historian Dio Cassius writes that after the sacking and raising of Jerusalem in 135 A.D., I'm quoting him now, all of Judea became almost a desert. They are wiped out. They are decimated. Gone. And by the way, 135 A.D. now, it is not only militarily that Rome is, is deciding to respond. They are also seeking to destroy the Jews as a people. Emperor Hadrian, when did he rule? 117 to 138 A.D., after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, makes a new political and fiscal policy, decrees against the Jews. I want you to note these. I'll put them on the screen for you. Number one, 
First of all, he prohibits any Jew under the threat of death from ever setting foot in the new Roman city built over the Jerusalem ruins. All right? You can never come back. Number two, he outlaws the practice of the Jewish religion. Whereas before they had been a religia licita, a legal religion, they now become a religia illicita, an illegal religion. And number three, he outlaws the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath. No more. No more Sabbath. Ladies and gentlemen, there they are. Two of the explosive ingredients in that cauldron of the early, early century of the history of Christianity. We've got the two. We have the Jewish, we have the Jewish people now. We have the, the Roman nation now. Let's introduce now number three. You've got to put all three to get tonight's tale and to get it straight. We now add the infant Christian church. I need to remind you, you know this, that the cradle of Christianity was Judaism. You think about it. The exploding growth of the church, and we can chronicle it in the book of Acts. The story is a story, really, of Jewish men, Jewish women, Jewish children becoming convicted that this Jesus of Nazareth was exactly who he said he was. He's the Messiah of God, the eternal God, come down in human flesh. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. And so by the hundreds of thousands, they are joining this fledgling new movement. And by the way, it is not only the Jerusalem citizenry who are joining the church. A very elite portion of that society was joining Christianity. And I want you to see this. It acts actually chronicles it, the book of Acts, which is the history of the early Christian church. Let me give you a, a page number here. Acts chapter 6, page 1057. Take a look at this. Not just the masses coming in, the hierarchy, the religious hierarchy. Acts chapter 6, and we'll read verse 7. There it is down at the bottom. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples, the followers of Christ, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And notice this, a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The early Christian church, the infant church, is exploding not only with the growth of Jewish citizens, but the Jewish clergy are flocking to follow this risen Christ. And you can be certain, folks, come on. As soon as a man or a woman in that climate accepts Jesus Christ as a Messiah, you know he's going straight back to his people, going straight back to his family, she is, and telling the good news of the gospel of Christ. And they are endeavoring to win Jew after Jew after Jew after Jew to this new movement. Now, at the risk of repeating myself, I need to say that in fact, and this is a vital point to lock in right here, we need to remember Christianity was a Jewish movement in the beginning. It started out humbly and simply with the disciples of Christ. And in fact, as far as the Roman Empire is concerned, they are one and the same. I mean, Christians and Jews, they're all, they're all the same. No distinction at all. Come on. They worship on the same Seventh-day Sabbath. It's clear. They worship in the same places, and it's true. The, Jew, the Christians worshiped in the synagogues unless angry Jews drove them out, in which they had to find other places to worship. But in the minds of the Roman leadership in the empire and the Roman citizenry, they are one and the same, just a troublesome sect out of Palestine. Which, by the way, describes and explains why Emperor Claudius reacts the way he does in Acts chapter 18. Take a look at this. You didn't think there were Roman emperors mentioned in the book of Acts. Yes, they are. There are several emperors that span that time. This is Emperor Claudius, Acts chapter 18, that's page 1072. Now we can understand why this reaction. This is Acts 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, there's the emperor now, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and so Paul came to them. Now look, folks, these are Christians. These are Jews who have, be who have become Christian. But when Claudius makes the decree, he isn't figuring out Jew or Christian. They are all the same to him, and they are all banned, driven out of the city of Rome. So it's clear, you see. In the Roman Empire, there is no distinction Jew and Christian. Which, by the way, does not describe how the Jews and the Christians felt about themselves. There is no question the Jews and the Christians never mixed each other up. 
because the Jews are absolutely convinced that the Christian church is out to destroy Judaism. And the Christians are absolutely convinced that Judaism without Jesus is a bankrupt system in the end. Which is why whenever you encounter their, their meetings in the book of Acts, you find Christians running into such strong and vociferous resistance on the part of the Jews. The Jewish antagonists, they are going around attacking them from place to place to place. But, and now the plot thickens, not only have the Jews turned on this new fledgling Christian movement, but Christians are now under increasing pressure from the Roman Empire itself. You know, for a while, Rome just ignored them. I mean, you know, they're just another little breakaway sect. Until along comes Emperor Nero. Does that name ring a bell? Emperor Nero, whose wife, let me share this with you, Empress Popea Sabrina, converted to Judaism in 62 AD. When his wife converts to Judaism, Nero soon becomes a friend of the Jews and he turns on this growing movement of Christianity with a vengeance within his empire. And when Rome is torched, remember that, uh, bur it burned all night. When Rome is torched, Nero springs on the Christians in Rome as the scapegoat for his cause. And Christians now are persecuted without a threat of mercy, covered with pitch and then hoisted up on stakes. They are lighted and they become human flaming torches in the night to lighten and brighten the imperial city. I want to tell you something. I have stood, many of you have, I know Sam and Anna have been there many times. I have stood in the Colosseum, there beneath the towering arches of that, that archaeological edifice. I mean, I tell you, it's a, it's a hushed awe as you realize that the Roman masses would come to that very place and would gather to the thrill at the slaughter of hapless Christians, one after the other. These men and women and children who refused to bow down and worship the emperor's God. And so the blood of Christians runs like a, cr a crimson river through the first, through, first few centuries of the story of the growing Christian church. And by the way, do you know this? Today, tonight, on this planet, do you know that there are certain countries that have marked Christians for extermination? Did you know that? We go on as if we had all the freedom in the world and there's no problem. Life is just grand on earth. I'm telling you, there are men, women, and children tonight whose lives are jeopardized because they have found a forever friendship with Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, maybe we ought to think a little more seriously about the gift of this friendship that perhaps we take too casually at times. So anyway, you can understand. When Rome turns with a vengeance on the Christian church, you can understand the quiet horror that the early Christians are feeling when their spiritual cousins, the Jews, are ruthlessly being smashed and are now declared a religio illicita you can now begin to sense that there is a growing pressure, a mounting pressure in the empire where most of the citizenry are pagans, and now the Jews have been declared to be an illegal religion. You can understand that if you are the spiritual cousins of the Jews, you are beginning to feel the pressure on yourself because I remind you, you worship on the same day as the Jews do. You worship in the same places as the Jews do. And when you're walking down the street, and it is the Seventh-day Sabbath, it is a Saturday in the empire, suddenly you realize that people are looking at you and they're not thinking Christian. They are thinking illegal religion must be another Jew. And so now in this boiling cauldron, the pressure is mounting. It is mounting on this growing movement that Rome has already turned on whose blood now flows through the streets of the empire. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, nobody can be surprised that within, and I'm grateful to Dr. Bakayoki for pointing this out, within the movement of the early Christian church, writers begin to produce, and here's how you put it, Dr. Bakayoki, from your dissertation. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Writers begin to produce a whole body of anti-Judaic literature condemning the Jews socially and theologically. More and more Christian writers are beginning to distance themselves, saying, hey, wait a minute, come on, come on. We are not one and the same. Please don't mistake us. Let me share a Christian writer with you named Justin Martyr. He lived from 100 to 164 A.D. He went so far... Get this, he went so far as to suggest that the Seventh-day Sabbath was, and I'm quoting him now, 
a brand of infamy imposed by God on the Jews to single them out for punishment they so well deserved for their, how did he put it, for their wickedness. Look at that, folks. No word about the Seventh-day Sabbath being a gift from a loving creator in which we can celebrate his forever friendship. Now, how does Justin Martyr describe it? A devastating condemnation. That's what it is. God gave the Sabbath as a punishment to the Jews. Whoa. I mean, it's like the poem in the beginning. Slowly but surely, a new path is being carved in the forest of history. A crooked calf path over which, in the end, almost all of Christendom will end up following and tramping. Now, I need to tell you, according to Dr. Bakayoki's research, that the change, this drastic change, did not happen just boom, like that overnight. Instead, let me share with you some of the developments. Let's talk about the church in Rome. The church in Rome began to emerge as, as the leading church within the, the wide body of the early infant church. We're talking about the congregation in Rome. And so their influence begins to extend farther and farther through the empire. Interestingly enough, it is the church in Rome that institutes a Sabbath fasting. They say, we're going to have a fast now on Saturday, on Sabbath, in memory of the death and burial of Jesus Christ. In fact, the fast began for them at noon on Friday and extended all the way through until 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. Once the fast was over on Sunday, then the Roman church declares, listen, now we celebrate the living and resurrected Christ and they move into feasting. I mean, look at They said, look, Jesus rose on Sunday. All of our pagan neighbors are, worship, are worshiping the sun god on Sunday, and we worship the son of God, and so why not? Through a subtle shift, just a little tiny shift in emphasis, even though they're celebrating both of the days, mind you, but it is that shift. Through that, the church in Rome is able to wean its followers away from what had, has now become the Jewish Sabbath. Hey, look, folks, you don't have to be, uh, I say this more than once, uh, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you're a kid and you aren't allowed to have food from noon on Friday till 4 o'clock Sunday morning, and then when Sunday comes, you get the best food in the world and celebration, you don't have to be too bright to figure out that pretty soon, which day is going to be your favorite day of the week? Come on. I mean, kids are kids, isn't that right? Yeah, and by the way, the, the church in Rome finally said, you can't celebrate the Lord's Supper on the Sabbath at all. You've got to wait till Sunday. I'm telling you, the pressure is on. And it started innocently. It started with us, we, we, are, we are not like our cousins. Please, please, please understand we are different. And so what happens? Well, through the second century, through the third century, Little by little, the Sabbath that Jesus kept, the Sabbath that the apostles kept, the Sabbath that the New Testament kept and taught is slowly but surely being dropped along the way until eventually the Christian community is left alone, all alone on the calf path. But the fact of the matter re remains that the pressure from the Jews is hardly reason to describe which day they chose. I mean, you know, the, the pressure from the Jews meant we don't want to have the same day, but they could have chosen Thursday or Wednesday or Monday. So how did they get into Sunday? The anti-Judaism at that time began to create a desire to substitute a new day of worship, but in that desire there was no choice over which day it should be. We just have to have, we've got to find another day. How did Sunday come in? Ah, let me share this with you. Let's put into our, our thinking now in the story of history a new emperor. His name is Constantine. He is a bright man. I mean, this man has political savvy. He would do well on the planet today. It's the fourth century now. His empire is in trouble because he has a vagabond movement of Christians in the empire who have now grown to an empire-wide force even after three centuries of ruthless persecution, and he's still got to deal with them. They are still out there. And he has all the rest of the pagan empire, so how is he going to pull them together so that they can live amicably? March, 321 A.D., brilliant stroke of political savvy and genius, Emperor Constantine makes a calculated 
political decision. And that is empire-wide edict that from henceforth, and it was March 7, by the way, 321 A.D., from henceforth, the venerable day of the sun will be a day of rest throughout the entire empire. In fact, I have here his line. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing on, in the cities rest. Now, folks, make it, let it be clear. It was not to be a religious day of rest. It's a day for citizens to simply refrain from their labor. They're already keeping Sunday for the sun god, and you folks are worshiping on Sunday for the son of God. And so, wow, we've got harmony now. We have peace. The fact of the matter is, if you can't lick them, join them. Constantine is no dummy. By the way, it is later reported that Constantine himself decided to be baptized as a Christian, and then, as legend has it, he wanted his whole, whole army baptized, and so he marched them through a river, and when they came out on the other side, he declared, you've all been baptized. You're all Christians now. <laughs> if you can't lick them, join them. It was a masterful stroke. And guess what? It worked. It brought comparative unity and quiet to the empire. For by the 4th century A.D., the Christians in the West have officially declared their day of worship to be the day of the sun. Sunday. Oh, it's the sun of righteousness who arose from the dead. That's how they defended it. And, of course, their pagan neighbors are already worshiping the sun god on Sunday. So it is a very convenient blending of pagan and Christian truth. But do you know what, folks? It was peace at a price. And when we come to the middle of the fourth century, the church convenes a council. It is a local council. We're not sure of the date. Somewhere around 340, 360 A.D., the council at Laodicea, and at last an official stance is ratified in wording. I want to read the wording to you. Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday. The Greek word there in that wording, by the way, is the sabbaton. It means the Sabbath. Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday or the Sabbath, but shall work on that day, but the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and if possible, do no work on that day, end quote. Just a wandering little calf in the forest, but when the centuries pass, the path has been ground into the forest floor of history, and almost all of Christendom has followed. You know what, folks? The more pressing question tonight is, shall I follow? Shall you follow? And on whose authority shall we follow the calf path? Shall it be the, the bishop of Rome during the time of Constantine, Bishop Eusebius, high-ranking Catholic leader? Listen to what Eusebius wrote. All things whatsoever that were prescribed for the Bible Sabbath, we have transferred them to the Lord's Day as being more authoritative and more highly regarded and first in rank and more honorable than the Jewish Sabbath. By whose authority, ladies and gentlemen, shall we follow the calf path? Shall it be by the authority of the convert's catechism? Let me read the convert's catechism with you. Look at this. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask again, by whose authority shall we follow this calf path? Shall, shall it be by the authority of Cardinal James Gibbon? How did he put it? You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. Then why does Rome venerate Sunday? Let's go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Now, the reason that the encyclopedia says the third commandment is because Rome eventually dropped out the second commandment, which says, don't have any graven images. And so to get rid of one, it reduced it to nine. They made the tenth commandment into two parts to get ten again, and it moves the fourth up to third. So by whose authority shall we follow? And by the way, if the Catholic Church claims to have changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, may I ask this question? Why do Protestant churches also worship on Sunday? You know what? That's a very good question. And the Catholics also ask it. Father O'Brien, 
John A. O'Brien, the late professor, former professor down here at Notre Dame University, I want you to read how he puts it. But since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it is inconsistent. But this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born, and by that time the custom was universally observed. They have continued the custom even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible, that observance remains as a reminder of the Mother Church from which the non-Catholic sex broke away like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you tonight, shall we follow the calf path of man or the fourth commandment of God. I'll put the fourth commandment back on the screen for you. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I repeat, whose authority shall we follow? Ah, but then come on, Dwight, does it really matter? I mean, this difference between tradition and truth, this difference between human custom and divine command, does it really matter? Aristotle, you remember that name from ancient history? Aristotle, 300 B.C. He made the following scientific observation, and he wrote it down in his journal. Get this. He wrote, The spider is a small animal which has six legs. You know what? That declaration was accepted as truth for 1,700 years until somebody else in 1400 A.D. happened to count the legs on the spider and found out there are eight instead of six. They had to rewrite their books when somebody rechecked the evidence. For 1,700 years, nobody challenged the great Aristotle, and so his false count, his false step down the calf path was followed mindlessly by all those behind him. Can't just follow anybody, can you? You want to talk about Hippocrates, the great progenitor of medicine as we know it today? Hippocrates, he's the one who came up with the idea that the way to save dying human beings is to bleed the poison out of their systems. And so what did Hippocrates do? He would open up a hole in the vein, and he would let the patient just bleed and bleed and bleed. And sure enough, they bled the poisons away. They also bled their lives away. It worked every time. Hippocrates, whose name, by the way, in whose name physicians still today pledge their professional oath, the Hippocratic Oath. By the way, George Washington, the first president of our nation, was bled by his physician who followed Hippocrates' rules, which in the end only hastened the death of the president. I mean, does it matter to you, ladies and gentlemen, which tradition you believe in, what tradition we follow, ask any practicing physician today and she will tell you it matters indeed. It can mean the difference between life and death. My friends, just because something has been believed and practiced in all sincerity by those who've gone before us does not then make it right or true. Because you can be sincerely wrong. You can also be dead wrong sincerely, Mr. Hippocrates and Mr. President Washington. Sincere, but dead. Because sincerity can never be a substitute for truth. Jesus himself made that point. At the beginning of our lecture, and I want to put that text back up from Mark chapter 7. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of man. Human sincerity can never be a substitute for divine truth. And what's divine truth? Ah, remember the Sabbath day 
to keep it holy. It's the truth about the God of the universe who came down to this little dark spot in the cosmos and he creates a race in his own image. And so eager is he for our friendship that not only does he give us life, but he also gives us a day in which we can celebrate a forever friendship with him. Every seventh day he says, I've given you a gift in time. I've hallowed it. I've blessed it. I've sanctified it. It is my Sabbath that I give to you. So that every man, every woman, every child who will ever be born into this life can know that I am the creator. I am your forever friend. I want to walk with you every step of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter is that when God himself came down to this planet and he stretched out his arms on Calvary, why did he die? He died so that we could see the truth. Our forever friend, not only the Lord of the Sabbath, also the Lord of salvation. They, they are one and the same. You don't have one God here who's the Lord of salvation. You don't have another God here who's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is one and the same. Same Sabbath, same salvation, same Savior, same forever friend. Always the same. You know what that means? We have a choice. Follow the calf or follow the cross. Follow the crowd or follow the Christ. They are two separate pathways. Only one of them is the path of Jesus. So here's the question. Which path should I choose? What path are you going to choose? I want to end with a story. My very good friend George Vandeman who was the founder of the international telecast, It Is Written. He tells this story in his little classic entitled A Day to Remember. It's a story about a winter's night when a Roman legion is encamped in a little lakeside town in France. Forty spiritual heroes unwilling to renounce their faith in Jesus Christos, unwilling to bow their knee to the emperor, have now been sentenced to die stripped naked out on the heart of that frozen midnight ice. Banded together in the biting, numbing cold, they begin to sing, they begin to chant. The stern, proud Roman legionnaire, their commander, standing from the comfort of his fireside tent, hears the echo of that midnight chant wafting across the frozen surface of that lake. He hears their chant, Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, claim for thee the victory and ask from thee the crown. They chant into the night, Forty wrestlers for thee, O Christ. And that proud leader of this company of soldiers, these are 40 of his own heroes. He has tried to plead with them, just bow the knee to the emperor. It isn't that big a deal. And they've refused. And so they've been sentenced to death. He listens. Forty heroes, they chant and they chant. He moves out into the cold darkness. He gathers some more driftwood. He's going to stoke up this fire. He's going to make it even brighter and somehow entice it. You've got to come back. Give up this notion. And so the fire rages high into the night. But instead the chant. Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee. Claim for thee the victory and ask from thee the crown. As he listened, suddenly the song changes. Thirty-nine wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ. And in that moment, as the chant still hangs in the icy night air, one of the condemned races up and collapses by that fire, panting, I give up, I yield. And that centurion looks down at this pitiable specimen of humanity, and for one moment his soul wrestles before his own company can stop him, strips off that crimson robe, and with a shout over his shoulder, as I live, I will have your place. He marches out onto that frozen surface, and moments later, the chant with a fresh note of triumph resumes, 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. Claim for thee the victory and ask from thee the crown. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a simple choice. Follow the calf, follow the cross. It's one or the other. Follow the crowd, follow the Christ. Two separate pathways. Only one of them is the path of Jesus. The calf path of the first day 
or the Jesus path of the Seventh-day Sabbath. Only one of them is the way of Christ. Tonight I ask you, what choice will you make? Not the choice of your boss on the job, not the choice of your family back at home, not the choice of your circle of friends. What is your choice? The issue is not where you've been prior to tonight. The issue for you, my friend, is where the path goes this evening, beyond this moment. Holy Christ, the path is clear. It is your salvation and your Sabbath, please. With courage and grace and faith, may we follow you your path, your cross, your friendship. Amen.